All right, welcome. I'm here with uh, Ben Sheridan, uh, learning innovation coach at NIST in Bangkok and co-founder of 407 Learning, a professional learning company. Uh, welcome, Ben. Hi, thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. Uh, ben, can you tell us, uh, you know, a little bit more about um, uh, about yourself and about uh, NIST uh, in Bangkok there? Okay. Uh, I've been at NIST for four years. Uh, uh, like you mentioned, I'm a learning innovation coach. Uh, I primarily sit in the elementary school, uh, but I do work across the school. Um, there's uh, four learning innovation coaches, and uh, in elementary, we sit in the coaching office with uh, the mass coach and the literacy coach. Uh, we work with teachers uh, sort of on a voluntary basis. Uh, we'll, so our, our, our work sort of uh, operates at different levels, but at, at uh, one level, we work directly with teachers around um, practice that they would like to improve on so they can approach us to uh, explore a new um, practice they want to implement in their classroom, and we uh, sort of enter into a coaching cycle with them. Um, or we can just uh, co-teach with them, or we can come model a lesson, et cetera. Uh, we also work with leadership uh, on programmatic implementation. And so we look at like, what are some larger scale changes that we want to see happen? And then we can also look at how we can support that uh, across the school or with specific teams. Um, and uh, sort of, just helping to move things along. We sort of act as a go-between between, between uh, leadership and, and the classroom. And so mm -hmm. when leadership looks at imp implementation or trying to, to uh, get things going, uh, we, we, since we're in the classrooms, we can actually see you know, how it's playing out and then mm -hmm. relay that back to, to leadership so they can help make tweaks or adjustments. Yes, I'm sure you were in, you were in high demand uh, as you know things transition. You know this whole spring uh, at, to the COVID nineteen. Um, can Can you tell us a little bit more about um, NIST um, for people who might not be familiar? Um, you know sure. what kind of like how big is it? What students does it serve? You know a little bit about any affiliations that it has. Uh, yep, sure. Yeah, so uh, NIST was founded in the early nineties, I think nineteen ninety two. So our campus actually is sits worse downtown Bangkok uh, in the middle of the city and right on Sukhumvit 15 and our, our campus used to be the campus of uh, International School of Bangkok and then International School of Bangkok in like the late 80s moved out to uh, Nichida which is like a suburb of Bangkok and there's a lot of um, families who work for embassies in the United Nations uh, which are all located downtown and so they looked at um, starting another United Nations school, like the one in Hanoi at Eunice. And so they kind of were in talks with the United Nations for, I think, a couple years. And in the end, the United Nations, I don't think, was interested in starting another school. That's not what they do. Uh, but they said they'd offer support. And so a group of parents got together and started NIST. Uh, and so they had this, this building that was empty. So they kind of took over the campus. Uh, the United Nations wrote a letter of support and, and, and gave it to the parents and the parents, uh, you know, came up with the charter and uh, like a mission and uh, wanted it to be a truly uh, international school. And so they decided to go uh, with the IB curriculum or IB framework. Mm -hmm. uh, so we're a full IB world school. We are a nonprofit school as well. Uh, language. Uh, because of the international nature of the parent body, language was central to our like sort of core tenants at the beginning. Mm -hmm. And so we have uh, a very strong uh, world language program. So we have an extremely high number of A-level languages. So if you're, you know, uh, and, it, and it depends on our uh, enrollment. So based on enrollments, we offer, if we have a high percentage of specific nationality, we will offer A-level language in that nationality. And then beyond that, we have I think we have almost 20, 20 something languages we offer total and nine or 10 like a level or first like, uh, you know, home country languages. Yeah, so, um, yeah, yeah. So it, we're, we're, we represent like 53 serve somewhere in the fifties nationalities, you know, it depends. Uh, we have 1600 students. Uh, we actually have a high number of kids that um, actually go through the entire 
their entire educational career at NIST. I think Bangkok, mm -hmm. you know, international schools themselves are transient, uh, but Bangkok has such a high um, expat population that we mm -hmm. see kids who are not Thai actually staying through their entire um, educational career. So yeah, as well as I, Thais, yeah. Yeah, and that speaks to, um, you know, I'm sure to, to this, the quality of the education in the school community, um, you know, that, that NIST, uh, NIST has. And that, that UNESCAP office there, um, right downtown, does, does so much impactful work in the region. Uh, the UN, right, edu was Economic Social Commission for Asia Pacific, um, yep. include, including their work, I know, on, uh, on, on global citizenship, education, and, and education for sustainable development. Um, yeah, it's a, a lot of fantastic resources. Something to talk about another time, maybe. Yeah, um, for sure. Uh, so I, before we, um, you know, get into some of the, you know, some, some of the uh, more hard, uh, some of the aspects of uh, NIST organization that, that uh, maybe contributed to uh, its success um, through, um, through the pandemic here, um, you know, schools are, by nature, um, about people, right? About people connecting with one another. And it's a very, um, and, and while a lot of it can be about, can appear to be about academics, uh, academics, right? It's about people connecting with people on an emotional level. Um, and so I imagine that this uh, whole, the pandemic's been a very emotional experience for you personally and professionally. Um, you mind sharing just a little bit um, about that and what did the school you know, what did NIST do to, you know, support you and maybe other members of the community? Yeah, I think that's actually um, a great place to start because I think NIST is unique, not unique, but I think one of the unique things about NIST is that it really has, um, it puts people first. And that's one of the, the first things I noticed when I started um, is I'd be walking down the hall and people that I hadn't met yet would actually stop and say hi and take the time in a busy day to just say hello and ask your name and ask, you know, what you do and, and, you know, just, they're just friendly. And so that's sort of consistently been something I've noticed that like, you know, we are all professionals, we're all educators, uh, but we're people first. And I feel like uh, the community of educators at NIST is actually a community of humans. <laughs> you know, I know that kind of sounds funny, but there's always this understanding of like, you know, at the end of the day, you know, we have to go home and we have to, you know, we're going to come back tomorrow. So we have to leave feeling okay. We have to like want to come back to work. You know, it's not just we're here to do the job. Of course we are. But in order to do that well, we actually have to be, uh, you know, balanced and we have to be whole. So there's a pretty big commitment to, to wellness and the balance and to support it to, to support each other uh, through this so you know that's uh, it you know and through that you know you have open dialogue you have uh, ways for people to you know express themselves etc and I'm not saying it's all like sunshine and rainbows because like when you create this type of environment you know people do you know express themselves and so they're not always happy and especially in, a, in an environment, you know, in, in a situation like we just had with, with the, you know, the shutdown and, you know, home learning and, and this sort of thing. Um, people, people at NIST take their, take their, how do I phrase this without sounding like, they, they take their jobs very seriously. Like mm -hmm. they, they, they take their students' uh, well-being and their students' education very seriously. And so they operate at a very high level. And so when you throw someone into a new situation and they're expecting themselves to be able to operate at a specific level and they may not feel comfortable or have the tools to do that, uh, you know, anxiety is very high, mm -hmm. you know? And so because I think we have that strong community and that strong support system, uh, it allowed people to sort of, you know, keep, keep, keep going even though that anxiety or the stress may have been high you know and then throw throw on top of it like everything now is way more transparent than it ever has been because everything's online right so basically mm -hmm. 
especially in the early, you know, elementary for sure, between the teacher and the student is the parent, right? Mm -hmm. And at a new level, because yeah. they're the ones who are at home with their kids. They're helping their kids through the situation, right? Especially even in the earlier years, right? So mm -hmm. that, that's sort of a new level of uh, transparency uh, mm -hmm. that teachers aren't, aren't super used to. So um, yeah, I kind of went on a little bit of a tangent there. No, so it's, uh, you, you're right. Um, you know, this has redefined that uh, our previous conceptions of, you know, parent or home school relationship um, were probably inadequate <laughs> to, you know, to describe, you know, what, what this has um, really created the, the type of dialogue, or sorry, you used the word transparency of what yep. school is about. So, um, but I, I want to dial it uh, back to, I guess, the, the beginning of, of this, um, the uh, shut of the shutdown. Um, so what, what was the school's initial response? And I'm sorry, let, can, can you maybe describe a little bit the timeline in Thailand? Because I think it's different in, sure, in yeah, other yeah. parts of the world. Yep. And then what the school's response was to that. Yeah, so uh, we were actually, so we were lucky, right? Because uh, we were sort of behind China and sort of Vietnam and these other schools that, uh, you know, were forced to force into this earlier and sort of forced to it, you know, where, where teachers were all over the place. We were all, you know, sort of in Thailand. So at, we actually started preparing um, in, in early February, like right at the beginning of February when we saw things happening in China. Mm. Uh, and, and, you know, it's funny because you hear things from different sources and, oh, you know, th that won't happen here, you know. So, but regardless, we started preparing. We actually started running practice days. We started looking, you know, we started talking to a lot of different schools uh, and learning from their experiences. And so we started mm. sort of nailing things trying as much as we could to nail things down as best we could uh, and flesh things out and, and actually get everything down in writing. And so we worked with, uh, with, with other schools to sort of get an idea of, you know, what are the, what are the, you know, the supports and structures that we need to put in place and what are the things that, you know, you're quickly learning or you wish you would have known, you know, ahead of time that you can, you can pass on to us. And then how do we, we look at that and then translate that into our context um, mm -hmm. and then sort of bounce this off teachers. And so uh, we quickly learned that, you know, communication was one of the, the key things that was, uh, that needed to happen and then needed to happen really well. Uh, mm -hmm. We also learned that like core systems and practices, like it wasn't a time for innovation. It was a time to consolidate and really, nail down the, the core central tenets of how school was going to look like how things were going to operate like your day to day like how does a day look you know and like how are how are students teachers and parents communicating within a day how do how do how are you moving stuff back and forth you know this like real basic sort of stuff then after like all these things are nailed down and also like don't move too much too soon so if something's not working, it may just be like that implementation dip, right? So like give people a week to figure it out. And then if it's still not working, then maybe you can, you can look at tweaking it, but don't, don't start changing stuff on a daily basis, you know? Uh, and so we started uh, working on that. We sort of hit it really hard and then we sort of dialed back a little bit uh, because things were like, ah, uh, I don't think it's a big issue. And then, yeah, after a couple more weeks, we were like, oh, you know what? Yeah, we should definitely get on this. Mm -hmm. So we're prepared. Uh, and then we got back on it. And then things started accelerating really quickly. And then it was like March, uh, early March. We were like, okay, everybody stay home. We're going. We're going online. Mm -hmm. so, so that was a school decision for you guys? For, for uh, your, it was a government. It was, okay. yeah, so it was a government thing, yeah. Let's see. Okay. Well, I think, you know, I think, uh, you know, it sounds like you, you know, you, you put it in sort of a passive way that you benefited from being behind, uh, you know, behind, you know, I guess seeing this tsunami coming. Um, but in a lot of ways, it sounds like you took a lot of really proactive 
you know, did a lot to be proactive with those practice days and reaching out to other schools and putting things down in writing. Um, what, you know, maybe can you describe a little bit more, um, you know, what those practice days, like, what do you mean a practice day? And, and I guess what did, well, could you maybe unpack that a little bit for, you know, for me? Yeah, sure. Uh, so, um, let me touch on something you said a little bit like when we actually so you're right we actually were talking to a lot of uh, different schools and what we looked at was not so much like specific like tools that they were using but more the structures they were operating within and mm -hmm. so we looked at what what elements of these structures are being successful that we can implement and so like the tool we insert can be X, but if that tool's not working, then we can, you know, put in tool Y, but the structure mm -hmm. is actually what's important, right? Mm -hmm. So we, look, we took a lot of time to sort of learn, learn about that, the mm -hmm. different structures that were being successful. Uh, the second question, sorry, tell me again, what was the second part of your question? Um, if you could un unpack a little bit what those, I guess, what those practice days were and, and I guess what, oh, you, yeah, yeah, what yeah. maybe you learned from them, yeah. Yeah, sure. So practice days were literally, uh, well, you know, in elementary school, it's like come to school uh, and we're going to practice home learning, but you're, you're here, but we're going to pretend you're not, you know, so we're going to run through <laughs> our systems and structures to see if it actually is going to work, right? Mm -hmm. And to see what, what we actually have to, you know, where the friction points are, what we need to work on making, making work better. Uh, you know, because mm -hmm. you can plan for this stuff all you want, but until you actually roll it out, you know, there's so many moving parts. And sometimes it, it's such a system that you, you know, you have to understand how one little thing can have a knock on effect, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and then um, in secondary, we actually had the kids like stay home half the day. So they, they would, you know, practice delivering, you know, synchronous online sessions via Zoom with the kids at home, then they came back. So we actually ran through a couple different uh, practice days. So one, you know, was a half day, one, you know, half the kids stayed home half this day, half the kids stayed, you know, home that other day. And then in elementary school, we had the kids come in and practice, and then we had the kids stay home and practice. And, you know, so we just ran through, you know, in reality, how is it actually all going to work? Yeah, it's, uh, it sounds like a, you know, great, learning opportunity and, and one that not not a lot of people had the opportunity to do and even those that did have the opportunity maybe didn't take the opportunity <laughs> yeah and that it all comes down you know, it was our leadership you know they they had the foresight to you know i guess you figure you know you run fire drills and you know emergency drills and all that stuff because you need to be prepared for when you know it hits the fan but like mm -hmm. You know, so they, I, I don't know if that was the mentality they yeah. took, but it was definitely, um, you know, a big, big win for, for leadership and for that, for doing that, because it really helped. Yeah, so I want to come back to, um, you know, you, you talked about, it, it, you mentioned, that, you know, it wasn't about the tools, right, but it was about the structures. So um, yep. what, um, what did your school have to do, uh, or what did NIST do, if anything, to, to reorganize those structures to be able to, to react to this uh, and deliver remote learning? Well, I think we had to, you know, what, what a lot of people were saying and what we quickly learned is that, you know, you can't replicate, especially in elementary, you can't expect to replicate a in-school uh, experience uh, when the kids are at home. Mm -hmm. And so everything takes way longer. You know, and the communication uh, is so hard to get really, really, uh, to, to do it really well. And so we, we reorganized, like, what uh, was happening on which days. So we kind of abandoned the regular schedule and we said, all right, uh, we, I mean, we, you know, and part of the communication thing was we actually created visuals for things and then, and then shared that with parents. So it was very easy. And so we said, like, on Monday, you know, this is happening. Like, these are the teachers you're going to hear from on Monday. These are how many tasks your students will be assigned. Mm -hmm. Then on Tuesday, you're going to hear from these teachers. And these are how many tasks you're going to hear from, you know, see from them. And then on Wednesday, so, like, 
you know, we actually gave structure to the week. And then, you know, then the tools within that structure, we, we, you know, we can communicate, you know, on Monday from these teachers, you're going to, you're going to get these types of things in these channels. So we really just sort of broke it down. And so, uh, people could know what, what they needed to, to look for, where to look for it, and then like how much was coming. Yeah, I'm sorry. So can you um, maybe just clarify a little bit for me um, you know, sure. how, that, how that's different from um, what, their, you know, what their schedule might have been like before? You know, it sounds like you, know, you see this teacher at this time, right? And now you're saying, right? Yeah, so like, schedule, for example, yeah. So for example, like, uh, you know, we operate on a 10 day cycle. So they might go to PE, uh, you know, every third, sixth and ninth day. But now we actually operate on a, like a five day schedule. And so they would hear, they would, uh, you know, get tasks from their PE teacher every Tuesday and Thursday, okay. right? Or, or all specialists would be Tuesday, Thursday and world language, right? So, or, and then, you would get tasks from your homeroom teachers on Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and you would get this, mm -hmm. this number of tasks, right? Mm -hmm. Does that, does that so, make sense? Yeah, oh yeah, uh, uh, thanks for clarifying that. Um, so I guess, you know, what, um, what, you know, this is just one example, but so, you know, why, why did you uh, think of, go, what prompted the change, what prompted that change from that 10 day yeah. schedule to that? Yeah. yeah, well, it's because one, uh you, we need we needed to well one of the things we learned from other schools is that uh you had to scale back on on work because mm -hmm. people were trying to fill days with work and keep everybody busy and it was completely overwhelming especially at the beginning because not only were were you know kids and and parents again accessing the learning they were also learning how to access the learning, <laughs> right? They were yeah. learning all these new systems. They were learning, you know, how to operate like Seesaw. Like parents don't know how to, you know, operate Seesaw. They don't know uh, Google Classroom if, you know, they're supporting their kids or whatever LMS or whatever sort of, um, you know, any, any sort of system or software that kids are used to using, parents, they don't know. And so mm -hmm. that was another reason we sort of said like no new things at first. We're only using these core systems uh, because kids know how to use them. And then parents can be quickly up to speed uh, through actually mostly their, their, their children teaching them about how to, how to use these things. Mm -hmm. So we, we sort of wanted to say to make it manageable. So like, you know, you're going to get these many things on these days mm -hmm. uh, just so that like everybody understood and could actually engage with the learning. They weren't overwhelmed. Yeah, so, so you know, that's, that's a great example of, of something that, um, that NIST did to, to reorganize uh, itself. Um, and I'm sure there are lots of, I'm sure that there are other examples too. I'm curious, um, you know, reorganizing the way you do school um, in the midst of uh, of a crisis um, is we you know, require some pre-existing capacities or uh, mm, with, yep, within the yep. organization some dispositions and what are some of the things that already existed in within this that you think allowed it to to contribute to to the success during remote learning and in this change yeah and i think uh one of the things that really helped us is we have like a, a really strong commitment to professional learning. Mm -hmm. And we, I mean, we have, you know, uh, an office, you know, we have an office full of learning coaches, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, yeah. that, that teachers have access to across the school. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a very healthy professional learning budget. Um, you know, we have, um, so one of the things that, uh, the coaches run, you know, a couple times a year during an, in, a, you know, in-service day where, where kids are not there is a teacher teaching teachers professional learning, uh, day. And so we actually ran this, uh, we had it on the schedule to run 
And after COVID happened, we still ran it. We just did it virtually. So, mm-hmm. but was specifically focused on, you know, how were people um, leveraging the tools and the, the knowledge that they have to be successful in, in a home learning situation. So we wanted to like build, you know, sort of like that diffusion of innovation, you know, sort of idea and also build, build capacity and tap into the knowledge base. And so we, we understood that um, we have, everybody is, is unique and everybody has something special to share and everybody is, has this uh, depth of knowledge that we can all benefit from. And so going into this, that was just an understanding, you know, that's just how we sort of operate. And so I think, people felt comfortable sharing their, their learnings, but also people felt comfortable asking other people to share their knowledge and, and asking to access that knowledge. Uh, so we have like a very strong team, team sort of dynamic and teams really lean on each other. We have co-planning people, you know, our teams plan as a team. And so I think that allowed us to transition into this, to this, uh, situation because people they divided up the labor you know this division of labor so it's like i'm gonna do the math you know so we were creating lessons and and content to post online for kids to engage with but it wasn't like five teachers creating five of the same lesson right it was one teacher creating it for five other teachers and so the other teachers it gave them space and time to do other things that everybody else benefited from as well so I think sort of, you know, this idea of, uh, you know, this commitment to professional learning and this idea that we are all sort of in beta, you know, but respecting each other's uh, knowledge and skills, but also respecting the fact that like, you know, I'm going to share this, even though I have this, you know, this depth of knowledge doesn't make me an expert. Like I still have stuff to learn. So I'm going to learn actually by sharing it with you. And then you're going to share back with me a little something that I didn't know about it. Yeah, it's all right. I kind of hear there's, there's a, a mirror here between, you know, what you were talking about earlier, where the, as an organization, the school was scanning the environment for, to, to learn from what other schools were doing. And then, you know, once it came time um, to, to, you know, make this, to go live within the school, you um, sort of, you did the same thing, right? Having teachers, you know, share what they knew, share what they know, and at the same time, you know, feel, you know, feel safe um, in, in asking for others what they know. Um, you know, I, I, so I, yeah. I started my, yeah, so sorry, so I started my career at an all boys school, and one of, one of my lines, um, you know, used to be like, you know, a real man knows how to ask for help, right? Mm-hmm. An all boys high school. And, and so I, I'm hearing, you know, that sort of here, like a real professional, right, knows, you know, knows when to give help, but they also know when to ask and receive help. And in this case, it's, you know, in this transitional online learning. Um, is that yeah. fair? Yeah. Yeah, it is fair. And, and you know, and, and an interesting sort of uh, wrinkle in that was, you know, our leadership, you know, said that to our teachers, like, you know, mm-hmm you know, it doesn't have to be perfect, you know, and like, so every day, like teachers would make morning message videos, and they would release them at specific times. And it was sort of like, that's how we took attendance. Kids would, would go in, in elementary, they'd go into the, their seesaw, they'd watch a morning message. And then in the morning message, the teacher would say, you know, your attendance task is to respond with this, you know, blah, blah, blah. And teachers, kids would respond. And, and they were also creating, like I said, these little mini lessons for kids, you know, pre-recorded stuff and and so the it was a lot of work and it was new right mm-hmm. it's all it's all new and you know leadership was like don't worry it doesn't have to be perfect you know they were giving them permission not to be perfect right but mm-hmm. then on the flip side the teacher teachers were saying well like yeah well this is going in front of parents like <laughs> this is public so like i'm i'm glad that you're you know you're giving me permission but like i don't feel comfortable <laughs> you know mm-hmm. like doing this so you know what are you doing to support me to give me time and space to develop these skills like within our within our day you know Mm -hmm. so i think it it goes both ways it's 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 one thing to say yeah you have permission it's another thing to put the the time and the structures in place to support that 
so like our ISC day where we actually took the time we dedicated the time specifically to this knowledge sharing and knowledge development around these practices from each other so we were in essence saying it, it it's valuable enough for us where we're actually going to set, set aside the time to help you help you get better at this yeah i'm sure too you know when you're talking about that you know that one math teacher creating math lessons for five math teachers there's a there's a high element of trust there among faculty too because like you said maybe i'm putting this lesson you know i'm implementing this lesson in front of parents that i didn't put together myself right so right maybe, right right yeah and so that's um so yes yeah, it's, it's uh you know really it's great to hear all of the all of the the learning and sharing that that was going on to help uh, the school you know be able to to uh you know put together some meaningful some, some meaningful learning you know for for faculty and for students um yeah well let me let me, so let me back up a little bit i'll go back to the beginning like a year a year and a half ago we actually have a i mean you use the word trust we actually mm -hmm. have i mean we identified that like maybe people didn't feel like trust was as high as it should be at our school mm -hmm. so we put together a team of teachers developed a committee to look mm -hmm. at like what are the factors what are the facets of trust that we need to be thinking about you know where do where do these things where are they expressed what are the behaviors people engage in to to mm -hmm. show that like trust is being practiced and then we actually spent time learning about it spent time talking about it you know it's like you know sort of like we're talking cultural elements too right so like there mm -hmm. are behaviors that support specific elements of culture and so mm -hmm. you have to identify those or you, you can try to identify those behaviors and then you highlight those behaviors mm -hmm. right but you can these behaviors can be happening but if you want to cultivate them you have to draw attention to them and you have to recognize it right and you have to allow you have to create the environment or the situation where people can engage in those behaviors. Mm -hmm. So it's, you, you took the time to build, you know, to build that trust. You, you, you that's. Um, well, we worked on it. We were like, yeah, know, and, that's what I mean. Yeah. yeah, we worked on it. Yeah, I mean, it's just like, like I said, we're, we we're always in beta. You know, you never. That's mm -hmm. the thing, right? Especially at our school, <laughs> it's like it's. You know, you only look at where you want to be, not sometimes not where you've come from. And I think that's one of the things that we actually learn more. We continue to learn through this experience is you really need to stop and recognize where where you've come, you know, because if you're only looking forward, you're never going to reach it. It's mm -hmm. like, you know, that, you know, in the movie where the hallway, you know, you're running and the hallway just gets longer. Right. Because yeah. that's we as educators, that's just how we are, because, you know, the outcome is always we need to be going forward. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, there's always more to learn. There's always ways to improve. So it's important, I think, to actually nail down some some hard and fast, you know, signposts and measure progress towards those signposts. And then on the flip side, you know, when I sort of talked about the communication thing, you know, when you when you wrap parents into this, right? Parents are anxious. Parents are, uh, you know, just trying to do their job the best that they can. But if you are trying to address parent anxiety and parent complaints, it's really difficult to measure progress towards that because once you satiate one, you know, group or, or you know, one parent, another parent pops up, right? And then if you satisfy one one area another area is going to pop up so it's really hard hard to measure progress but mm -hmm. if you clearly communicate what you're trying to achieve and then you build measurements toward that goal mm -hmm. right and it should be focused on teaching and learning obviously because that's what we're here for at the end of the day then you can communicate to parents they may not be happy but you can say hey you know what look we are moving closer towards our goal because we have this evidence Mm -hmm. You know, and so we're actually doing what we are supposed to be doing, which is focusing on teaching and learning. And here's the progress we're making. And, you know, so you may not be happy about it, but like, this is what we're here for. We're not here to keep, you know, we're, we're obviously we're, you know, we have to be mindful and we have to help people understand, you know, what we're doing and why we're doing it. 
but you know anxiety anxiety and stress expresses itself in weird ways with everybody mm -hmm. right so i think you just have to remain kind of focused yeah so it sounds like um you know that, that nick has a really strong sense of of uh what it wants to what it is and, and what it wants to be for for its uh school community um for its students for its teachers for its parents um i'm wondering um if this situation if the school shut down um you know has made has maybe changed in the eyes of you know from the perspective of your parents or your teachers or your, or your students what the school means to them or what this what the purpose of NIST is in their lives yeah and i think you know i don't know that we know that yet you know because we mm -hmm. actually haven't come back you know we came back mm -hmm. for like a day uh we definitely got you know we got we had all you know we had all sorts of feedback from parents you know that covered the <laughs> spectrum but you know we definitely got a lot of really heartfelt very honest messages from parents you know and they really like sort of you mentioned you know they really said the response and the dedication of the school and the teachers to the situation was was not surprising and it was sort of an expression of who we are as a, as a school and who we are as a community because no you know we were really focused i mean we had a very very strong focus on well-being on student well-being and we we'd actually you know spent time creating experiences like we had virtual assemblies we had virtual house days you know our pe department put together this amazing uh virtual week-long olympic uh thing that happened that was like it involved the entire community you know like parents were doing it kids were doing it brothers sisters you know um and mm -hmm. so like things like that really you know the, like i mentioned earlier these are the behaviors that express that aspect of culture right that we actually mm -hmm. do value community we do value wellness we do value the whole child so mm -hmm. these these things support that that idea and so parents you know they 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 under, they have a better understanding of like how important those those aspects are yeah and so it, i guess what i'm hearing is that it's um we're, we're talking about something now deeper than just what the school did during online learning right you were talking about the culture of the school right that just expressed itself you know, um, that, that expressed itself in, in this particular circumstance and that people were skillful enough to be able to, you know, to live that, live those cultural values, that they have the courage to live those cultural values, right? And that they were supported by leadership to live those cultural values. Yeah, and I think, uh, you know, I don't know if other schools have mentioned this, but I think, I've seen it at my school uh, at NIST and as well as at a lot of other schools is everything is magnified in this situation because of the high level of transparency and how long things actually take to happen. And so if you're disorganized, <laughs> it becomes quickly apparent, right? Yeah. And if, you, if you're not good at communicating, it becomes quickly apparent, mm -hmm. right? And if, if teams aren't working together well, it becomes quickly apparent, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so on the flip side, you know, if, if you have a consistent approach and you have a measured approach and you're planning ahead and, you know, you're, you're listening to, uh, you know, you have your finger on the pulse and you're building these feedback loops and you're tweaking things as they, as they move forward, you're going to notice that, that that's really going to come through. And if you value mm -hmm. the student experience and you value the wellness of teachers, you're going to, you're going to put these things into, you know, you're going to put things in place over time that support these things. Yeah, you know, uh, Edgar Schein talks about, you know, he talks, so cultures, the way we do things around here, right? And so yep, this is yep, just, yep. this is amplified the way NIST does things, right? Yep, yep, yep. So I'm, I'm curious, um, uh, you know, maybe just a couple, um, We've talked at kind of a high level about all this. Are, are there some specific examples of, you know, some creative practices that, that you saw maybe among faculty or you talked a little bit about professional learning, but then also with, with student learning, 
um, that you're proud of and that you wanted to share with others? Well, like I, I just mentioned the, um, the, NIST the, NIST, and, the yeah. yeah, the NIST Olympics, which was like, um, so uh, uh, Carlos Galvez uh, was a teacher in Vietnam and he put on like a, a NIST Olympic situation. Let me know if this is too loud. I don't, they just started to start building a building across the way here. So it's kind of getting loud. I don't know what they're doing. I always use dump trucks, but I can move inside if it's too loud. No, I can, um, I, no, I can hear you. No problem. Okay, good. Um, uh, so we, you know, he heard about this and, and, you know, he reached out to me in my class as a coach and, you know, um, you know, and then I reached out to, to Carlos, even though Mark, Mark, where Mark is down as our PE, our PE, uh, lead. And so we reached out to, to Carlos and we set up a meeting and we, we sort of talked through like how it went and how he did it, uh, and the tools he leveraged, you know, he used Flipgrid in a really cool way. And, and then, you know, we, we sort of batted around, you know, uh, ways that we could sort of, you know, take his idea and then, you know, put it on steroids and run it across the school. And, and then we approached leadership and, and, you know, again, so like we're asked, we're putting all, this hasn't been done before and we're putting it up, you know, we're going to put it in front of parents and, you know, high pressure situation and, and leadership, you know, did their due diligence and, and, you know, listened to us and then, and then, you know, communicated back to us, you know, the the things that we really need to think about and then they then they just supported us and they just sort of like got out of the way and mm -hmm. you know marcus and his team did this amazing job of preparing and 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 marcus did his due diligence and we went through and like tested 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 i think that's another thing that we mm -hmm. that i didn't mention earlier is like test 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 everything in every situation because it's not going to go the way you think it is you know a lot of the time so we tested and tested and tested until we got it, you know, as, as close to we could as near perfect, right? Uh, and then we ran it and it was a huge success, you know? Um, but it, 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 it highlights like a commitment to stuff that's not strictly academics. It's a, it's also it highlights a commitment to supporting people as professionals uh, when they mm -hmm. bring an idea that, you know, is, is not coming from leadership. It's coming from outside of the school actually. And then it gives, yeah. uh, you know, and we actually sort of use this metaphor of spaces. So we, you know, leadership gave space for Marcus mm -hmm. to exercise his professionalism. They gave, uh, they created space uh, by having a coach, you know, so Marcus could approach somebody and we have a space to operate with each other. And then they created mm -hmm. space within the school day and within the school week for this to happen, you know, and space mm -hmm. within the community to allow parents to be part of it, you know? So I think that's sort of, it's, I guess it could be seen as innovative. Mm -hmm. uh, we just see it as sort of like, you know, how you should be approaching uh, a whole, a holistic yeah. view, you know, of education. Yeah, so, you know, that's a great example. Um, and I'm curious about the, um, you know, uh, so, uh, so recently I was, I was working, um, I, I, was, I was in charge of getting a coaching program off the ground um, uh, at a school in Shenzhen. And so I'm curious a little bit about your experience as a coach. And, um, you know, I, I was, I was going to use the, the phrase, you know, what did, what did you have to give yourself permission to do? Or maybe what did you have to give yourself space to do um, as, uh, you know, as, as a coach um, yeah. you know, during this time? Yeah, and so I think we, like, the coaches were really, um, we spent, I spent a lot of time, like, working with leadership and, like, creating documents, and, like, we, we developed, like, agreements, like, online learning agreements, and so, like, what, like, literally, we dialed down to, like, what are the daily expectations? When, when we say, like, teachers are posting in Seesaw, what is that, what is a post, what are the elements of a post? You know, like mm -hmm. how many posts, like, you know, like we, we, we really got specific. So there was mm -hmm. no really ambiguity around expectations. And so we would create this and then we would pass it to teachers and ask them to, is this realistic? Is this, you know, is this right? Is this correct? And then they would, they would offer feedback and then help us make it better. So we spent a lot of time mm -hmm. sort of doing that. 
Um, mm -hmm. One of the things that I had to do as a coach, I had to give myself permission to actually sort of like let go of, you know, in my, I'm a, like a systems thinker and like I see things through. So I'm like, okay, like unless I can see something through, I don't want to enter into it. So I got to figure out all the steps before we go, because if it's like, if we're going to start on something, then we're going to hit a roadblock. In my mind, we've sort of wasted our time, you know, but I, but I have had to let myself understand that like not everybody thinks that way. And I actually have to, to, to uh, let go of the fact that other people have a different way of looking at things and, and their may, their, their way of looking at it is just as valuable as mine. And I have faith that in the end, we're going to work, we're going to work through it in some capacity. Mm -hmm. So I had to sort of like, um, let go of this. I have to see how it's going to play out. All, Cause if I, if I'm going to work with the teacher mm -hmm. and they, they come and ask me for support, I got to make sure that what I'm offering is going to work, you know, right. cause I don't want to waste their time. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I had to sort of like let go of that. Uh, I got to see it all the way through sort of thing. Uh, I have to like trust that it's going to work. Yeah. I think that if, if any, if we can learn anything from, <laughs> from this is that there are some things that uh, have to, we have to change our plans. Right. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, and like, and it's like, I, you know, I, how to phrase this, like there's a certain standard, I guess, or a certain level of that, that I'm, uh, that I'm mm -hmm. before I release it, you know, like to a, a larger audience that sure. I feel like it has to be. Uh, but those standards may not, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're sort of like, I've, I've invented those standards per se. Mm -hmm. Right. And so like other people have just as high standards, but the work looks different. Mm -hmm. but the standards are just as high. So I had to be comfortable with the way that the work looked according to their high standards and not so much my, the way my high standards looked, right? The standards mm -hmm. were so high, it just looked different. So I had to be comfortable with like accepting other people's version of high standards. If that okay, makes yeah, sense. I, yeah, sure. I, yeah, I understand. Um, uh, and so I'm, so that's something that you let yourself, that you were able to let go of. Um, what are I think some everybody of the sort of yeah. yeah I think everybody sort of had to come to that sort of understanding right and so I think yeah. the 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 level of collaboration we've seen we saw between teams and among teams was was because people were actually able to sort of uh, you know respect other people's version of of high standards you know they they understood like you know if I was going to do this it wouldn't look like that at all mm -hmm. but you know. You, you, I trust that you're making this at a level that you feel comfortable with and I'm comfortable with that. And so even though it looks different, I'm going to, I'm going to roll with it. Sure. <laughs> a, yeah. There's some mind games going on in there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. Um, I'm, I'm curious. Um, what are some of the things that were, that, that you couldn't let go of though? Like, what are the things that you said, you know, I'm still, you know, as, as a coach, I'm still serving, um, you know, our faculty or learning community and, and these things, regardless of the situation are, are not negotiable for me. What, what are some of those things that, that you had to stay, that had to stay in place? Yeah, I think they're being responsive and uh, like I, interface more like I run parent training sessions you know all year and we do a lot of parent education around like how we operate as a school you know we're inquiry focused and we do a lot of uh, expect or parent education around like you know how we support students in, in learning and how you know we're not super focused on what the product look like we're, we're very focused on like process and and how how feedback allows kids to move closer to mastery, you know, et cetera. So I'm used to doing a lot of work around that, but I interface a lot with parent, a lot more with parents with specific like supports in, in the home. Like I'm having trouble with, you know, this aspect of seesaw or I'm having, you know, issues with helping my child with this. And, and so I don't really handle tech support questions mm -hmm. in my day to day. Like we have sure. an amazing tech tech support department. I'm more like, I, I want to focus on coaching and stuff, but I, I helped parents more than I ever have before. And so I, ha mm -hmm. I, you know, 
being responsive to the needs, I think is something I couldn't let go of, you know, even though I, I may not necessarily want to uh, help parents in that capacity. Uh, I, I felt like it was, that was my role in this situation. And then parents is, uh, sorry, teachers as well. Um, you know, just checking in with teachers a lot, you know, just reaching out unprompted, say, Hey, how's it going? Just on a personal level, how you doing? You know, how's it going? And, you know, you always get maybe a question here or there um, mm -hmm. or checking in with team leaders and, you know, how's it going with this? And, you know, how's it going with that? Just, just being a lot, you know, not letting go of that, even though we're not seeing each other every day and we can't pass each other mm -hmm. in the hall, definitely checking in to, to, to keep, uh, keep sort of, you know, poking in just to say, how's it going? Yeah, so I'm curious as a coach, you know, I'm sure like that you have, you mentioned that it's, um, you enter into agreements with teachers, it's voluntary at NIST. Um, what, what happened, you know, what happened with those coaching plans that you had? Um, did you put them on hold? Did you adapt them? Is, you know, sorry, yeah, no, everything's this is a little off script. This is, <laughs> I'm interested. Yeah, 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 no, no. Yeah, I think, I think what, what, what took precedent was like, what was in front of us, for sure. Yeah. Like we, we were like, okay, everybody's doing Zoom training on Tuesday after school. Mm -hmm. And so like my focus became supporting everybody in like, so that was one of our core practices, right? So like, all mm -hmm. right, so we're gonna get everybody up to speed on like the elements of Zoom and how they're gonna need to be using it. And that was like across the school, I'm talking like teachers, academic assistants, teaching assistants, leadership, right? Mm -hmm. And then same with Seesaw. So we, you know, Seesaw is one of our core practices. And luckily we've had like a lot of professional learning around Seesaw. Um, mm -hmm. But we sort of developed, uh, well, so like, and we listened to like teachers and in, in the way we have Seesaw set up, you know, we were gathering feedback. And after like two weeks, uh, we actually changed up a little bit of how we structured Seesaw and how it was set up to accommodate teacher, teacher needs, you know? Mm -hmm. So those are, those are sort of the things that like, we didn't let go. We, we kept like, okay, what are the things that are, you know, where are the friction points uh, for teachers mm -hmm. and in classrooms and, or even in teams. And so like, how do we remove those friction points? And that's sort of like more of like the systems approach to coaching. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's, it's, yeah, it's, uh, it's interesting. And I guess what I thought was off script was, actually tied in you tied it in nicely um, yeah well like so. that's so like the way I approach coaching I'm like I have a very systems approach to things that's just the way my brain works and so like uh you know I'm also like I'm uh, wrapping up a PhD in educational leadership so like I see things I see things well you can say congrats when I'm actually done right <laughs> but like I so like the way I view like I, I see things that are happening, like, but I also see like everything that comes before it. Well, not everything, but you know, my mind races to what came before it and what's coming after it, you know? So like, mm -hmm. this is, this is something that's happening, but it's related to like a million other things. So I look at like, in order to change this one thing, we actually look at, we have to look at a whole bunch of other things. And so mm -hmm. that's sort of how I approach when, uh, like when I see things happening. So a lot of times, even if I'm working with one specific teacher, I see how, uh, you know, where, how, what, what are the events or, uh, you know, factors that's, that this sits within. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Yeah. And I think that that's a, that's another great lens for looking at all the things that we were talking about today is, you know, any one of these aspects of, of this culture of what it's committed to of its learning community. Um, on its own, um, you know, it probably doesn't amount to too much. But when you put the put all these things together um, in, in the system that makes NIST in its community, um, that it it works together in a way that um, you know creates you know cr creates all the all the great learning that's going on there, and, and even through this really difficult time. Um, yeah, and so I think like I, you mentioned. Sorry, you mentioned earlier, like, uh, you know, like, well, we both had been talking about trust, right? Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, trust, like, if you read Dan Coyle's stuff, trust is really interesting. Most people think, like, in order to trust somebody, you have to get to know them. And then you develop this trust over time. But what he's found through his research is that 
in order to like gain trust, you have to show vulnerability. And mm -hmm. I think our leadership actually does, does that pretty well is they, they're not afraid to be vulnerable and they're not afraid to seek feedback. And I think modeling that for everybody sets the tone and creates mm -hmm. this culture where learning can happen. And I think because we have such a high commitment to professional learning and continued growth, that when new things come up, people aren't super resistant to them. You know, we do have a little bit of, uh, you know, initiative fatigue, like most schools, you know, yeah. like us do. Uh, but, you know, because we have this open learning culture, you mm -hmm. know, we're able to adapt and, and, you know, jump on things and learn them quickly. Yeah, that's, that, that orientation towards learning is, is really apparent, um, you know, in, 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 from an organizational perspective, you know, really shines through in, in what we're talking yeah. about. And, um, and it, yeah, and that, and that any of those, any of those professional learning initiatives without, you know, on their own, right? Lots of schools do use Seesaw or lots of schools try to build trust or lots of schools, um, you know, name initiative X, Y, or Z. Right. Um, but then if you don't have the leadership that supports you to, to really learn that through your practice, if you're not, you know, given the given space to exercise that, you know, as a professional, you know, that, that I think comes back to some of the this, this system aspect of, of, you know, what, what makes all those things work together. Yeah. Um, so I want to, um, last you know final thing here um through through all of this i'm curious uh you know what do you the, the changes that you've seen um during this remote learning and um you know and, and you know through the student aspect of it through the leadership aspect through the teaching aspect um any of those you know what are some of, what are some of the things that you uh hope might stick um you know when you come back when everyone comes back to school in the fall um feedback i think it's one of the things that um i think has been a big winner um i think lesson i guess that that sits within lesson design i think lesson design actually has also been a big winner uh because you know and like and I guess one more level to that would be like collaboration among teams. Uh, you know, we, we sort of take this approach, like these are my kids and only I can teach them. That sort of went out the window and like, sort of like when I was talking about, so like one year five teacher, so we, you know, our year five teachers, we'll just use year five. So like, you know, they teach all subjects, right? They teach math, science, you know, everything, right? One teacher to all their kids. So why, if we're operating as a team, why do we each have to create the same lesson five times? Why not just create it one time, put it somewhere, the kids can access it, you know, and then they're all doing, you know, independent exercises or group work or whatever, but that frees up uh, the other teachers to actually be giving feedback around learning and working more individually with the kids, moving them closer to the outcomes that we want to see. And so an interesting thing, so like I'm uh, in Seesaw, you know, you, you get reports and you see like the number of likes and the comments and stuff like that. At the beginning of April, we saw this real inverse and jump in number and in, in amount of feedback that was given. And I think what we saw was like, in order for kids to really understand in this environment, uh, where they were at in their learning and how to move forward, the feedback really became deep and rich. And I think that actually is something I really would like to see. And so we were giving feedback in, in forms we weren't before. Whereas we may just say a comment to a child in class. Now it's actually an audio comment that they can revisit or it's a video comment that they can revisit or it's written down in some way that it wasn't before so they could actually revisit. And so I think that's something I'd like to see is this continued use of like rich feedback in multiple forms. And I think this division of labor among teams can, can allow that to happen. Yeah, it's fantastic. You know, for both the student and for the for, for the teacher, you know, to uh, that's that's yeah, that rich feedback is is really important. Um, and it really and helps. The, yeah, and it helps the parent understand the process, the learning process, because mm -hmm. 
you know, a lot of parents think kids aren't learning if they're not busy or if the teacher's not in front of them or, you know, they're not seeing these mm -hmm. products of, uh, you know, worksheets with, with scores on them or something. But, you know, by seeing feedback and how it's used and understanding how or where their child is in this process of learning something and, and watching them progress through towards mastery, you know, it really, it really helps people really truly understand like what learning really is and like what we really value as a school, right? Yeah. Because we want kids yeah. to be, to understand where, how they learn, right? And become experts at learning. That's really what we want the kids to, to be, right? So they can learn yeah. whatever they want, whenever they want, especially in today's, today's, you know, you can access knowledge anywhere at any time. Mm -hmm. What are you going to do with it? <laughs> right. And to, um, you know, schools that try to make the shift to mastery based progression or mastery based learning, um, right. you know, parents will say, you know, oh yeah, yeah, I get it. And then they'll, or parents, teachers too. All right. But then they'll say, well, well what's my score? <laughs> or, right, right. Or how exactly. did they do it, right? And so there's yeah. that. And so I think that you touch on something um, uh, that is that's really valuable for anyone that's interested in in mastery based learning is, is the rich feedback that's been able to come out of this and um, and documenting yeah. that in the uh, in, in a more I, I, just better documenting it. So yeah. Well, so I think that's one thing I'd like to see. I think another thing is this. Um, this idea of like, we have some core, core tools, core systems that we all agree on and we all use consistently. Mm -hmm. And once those are down and everybody's like really, really solid, you know, then innovation can take place. And mm -hmm. therefore you can, you, you have some level of consistency and then the innovation that takes place actually can diffuse quickly because everybody is building on the same elements, right? And so I think that that's looking at, you know, becoming a really high functioning learning organization. You need those central tenants or those core agreements that you operate with on so that everybody's at the same place. So any innovation, any pathway to innovation can be followed by anybody in the organization because they're all starting from sort of the same place rather than this person's using these things and that person's using those things. And, you know, you have these pockets where people are following different pathways. Yeah, and, and, and to have the structures then to, to make that learning public and, yep. to, um, and, to, and to store, right, to, you know, that sort of organizational memory to be able to access that later, um, for people to feel empowered to communicate, yeah, to communicate that and you know, share that, you know, like if you mentioned, and, and, and be given the space to act differently and, and reflect on it, right? These are all, yeah. um, you know, things that, these are all aspects that are, that are so important to organizational learning. And, and I think our conversation, um, you know, casts a light on some really practical aspects of, of NIST culture or yeah. of, of how that operational, or what that looks like in practice, or right? what yeah, but organizational like you're, operationalized is. Yeah. It is cultural aspect too, because then, like you said, it, it becomes how we do things around here. And so someone who's new to NIST can be enculturated very quickly because everybody does the same, you know, there's like this baseline of understanding. And if you have that really down pat, then the baseline becomes very high. So you can operate at a very high level very quickly because you're enculturated very quickly because there's like a shared the shared knowledge shared understanding it's easy to tap into well it sounds fantastic and um it's uh it must be really you know, it must be a really special place to to get to to spend time and work with such a great school community um ben thank you so much for for contributing um to this series of discussions on on schools being learning organizations through this pandemic. Um, you know, if, if, if we listen in and we connect, you know, to people, you know, connect people like you with other people um, at, at other schools doing good things, um, we might just be able to create the, the schools that our kids that, um, both need and deserve, you know, for the future. So thank you very much, Ben. Yeah, my pleasure. I, I mean, just highlighting the amazing work that our, our school 
teachers and leaders and community is uh, are doing so it's uh mm-hmm. it's you know while i'm sitting here talking I, I i'm standing on the shoulders of you know everybody else that i work with so i'm happy to share the the amazing work that they're doing all right thanks ben thanks man